Well, it looks like we uh, were experiencing some heat. <laughs> the heat is on. I want to welcome each and every one of you to worship this morning. We are right in the, the midst of summer, and obviously we're feeling it. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us by Zoom this morning. So glad you could be with us on this um, sultry July Sunday. A sultry Sunday, that's what we'll call it. I'm going to ask Rick, um, Rick Wilkie, come down. He's got some, some things he wants to share. Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning, Rick. I just want everybody to know that's not here, okay? And I know some of you uh, are way out of town and everything, but I will tell you that I wish I would have brought a sweater because it's, it's very nice and cool in here, isn't it, everybody? Yeah. Yes, it's gorgeous. I feel like I'm in a movie theater or something. It's, it's cold. A uh, couple of announcements. First of all, the garage tours today. Uh, we're gonna meet up at Skipback at Brother Kirshner's and Italian Market behind, there's a parking lot back there. About quarter after 12, 12.30, 12.35, we're gonna be leaving to go to Sears Country Store. I don't, it's not called that anymore, if anybody remembers that, that what it, it's a, a hair salon or something now. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but those are where the first two garages are. Um, if you uh, have a problem or anything, please contact me. Uh, if you have my cell phone number, if you got a pencil, write it down. Two, one, five, eight, five, nine, one, one, seven, one. Okay, everybody got that down just in case you have trouble. The other thing that I, the other announcement that I would like to make is the garden is going great. We're sending just billions of tons of vegetables over to the place in Lansdale. It's working out so nice. We do have a rogue watermelon plant that we did not plant and had nothing to do with. It must have came up from last year somehow. And we have a itty bitty watermelon that's growing on it. So that's that we got watermelons coming. And thanks to Rita for uh, helping out with the watering and everything. Um, and if anybody wants to help, my phone number's in the bulletin. You can contact the office. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. The reason it's so cool in here is because Rick's here. Rick is cool. I'm going to ask us to, to center ourselves, to take a breath in and to remember that that breath is holy breath. It's the breath that gives us life. And it is that breath that comes from God. So let us worship.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. to our lives, so important, so central, so precious. I invite you now to join me in our centering prayer this morning. Loving, active, and ever caring God, we give thanks that you are present and near to us. Not only are you concerned with our welfare, but your concern and compassion extends to the ends of the earth and includes all people. May our worship strengthen our love for you, our bonds with one another, and fuel our desire to live a life shaped by your kingdom and its promise. We pray, hope, and live in the name of Jesus, our Lord, guide, and friend. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke. Of all the Gospel writers, Luke places prayer as a central part of Jesus' life. Every time Jesus makes an important decision, every time Jesus shifts his focus Jesus prays. And those prayers were incredibly intimate.
Luke writes, he was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if a child asks for a fish, would give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asked for an egg, would you give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So growing up, there were moments when I really wanted something for myself. You know, I'd want a certain toy or a certain article of clothing, a pair of Converse sneakers, or a fishing rod and reel. It wasn't until my teenage years, however, that I got fixated on buying a motorcycle. And luckily, growing up where I did, there were plenty of off-road destinations for me to ride. And some of my friends had motorcycles, and I was fixed and focused on getting my own. I did the research, and I found the motorcycle that I wanted. It was a Suzuki, and I set out to save up for it. Now, I had a paper route, and I cut lawns in the area. But until I had that desire, until I had that desire to buy that motorcycle, that Suzuki, I frittered a lot of my paper route money away on snacks at the corner store or buying gadgets that would soon lose their appeal. But I remember that night, that warm summer night, that my dad took me to Buzzardo's Sports Center on North Pearl Street, and I bought my Suzuki. My dream 
had come true. My prayer had been answered. The desire to own a motorcycle, that desire gave me energy, it gave me focus, it gave me determination and perseverance. And once I owned it, it brought me deep joy. There's nothing like focus and perseverance to help make things happen that you hope will happen. It was the focus and the perseverance of the man who ended up pounding on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night that caught my attention in this parable that Jesus shared with his disciples. This is a neighbor who just won't give up. He keeps pounding on the door for attention. His friend has arrived and needs to eat. And this man is going to make sure that his friend is well fed. Of course, when you pound on someone's door in the middle of the night, it better be for a pretty good reason. Now, I have been awakened in the middle of the night by a knock at the door. I'm sure maybe you have as well. But it's disorienting to say the least. The man whose door was knocked upon was understandably irritated. He didn't want his entire household awakened in the middle of the night. How insensitive and impolite is my neighbor, the man in bed was probably thinking. Of course, the difference between my perseverance and focus to obtain a motorcycle and the perseverance and focus of the man who ended up beating on his neighbor's door is that my perseverance and focus was self-focused. While the man in the parable beating on the door was focused on other. And that's the wonderful thing that Jesus teaches us about prayer. Prayer is asking for kingdom kind of things. Kingdom kind of things, like getting bread for a neighbor. That's a kingdom thing. For healing or for community, that's a kingdom thing. Or saving someone who has been caught in the web of addiction. You see, God listens intently to kingdom requests. And I'm not sure God pays attention to prayers for wanting a motorcycle or for securing a parking space in a crowded lot. Yes, I've actually heard people tell me that they have prayed for that. And when Jesus teaches his disciple the prayer that we refer to as the Lord's prayer, notice that it's about God's kingdom. And notice this. Our daily bread. Forgiveness of our sins. Praying that we are delivered from a time of trial. See, it's a communal prayer. There's no I. There's no I in the prayer Jesus teaches. There's a lot of us and a lot of we. Now, which is not to say we can't and should not pray for ourselves. You see, there are things we should and can ask God for as individuals. You see, Jesus was so connected to God that he could refer to God as Father, Abba, Daddy, a very intimate way to address God, this intimate reference, this relational reference. And Jesus' prayers to God were so deeply, deeply personal and focused on those requests to God. 
And yet those prayers, as individual as they were, were rooted in Jesus' desire to serve the kingdom, the realm, the establishment of God's reign on earth. They weren't prayers seeking personal preference or advantage. As I said earlier, the Gospel of Luke makes a lot of Jesus praying. At every important moment in Jesus' ministry, he prays. Jesus is praying during his baptism in Luke. And even while on the cross, Jesus prays for those responsible for his torture and death. My mother taught me my first prayer. And I remember this from childhood. You probably learned this or a similar version, which was spoken just before bedtime. It begins, now I lay me down to sleep. Anybody remember that? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And you know the rest. Some versions of this prayer then ask God to guard them from harm. The New England primer from the late 17th century states, If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. There's a reason for this this prayer, the way it was written and framed. Infant mortality in colonial America was very much on the minds of Americans. Listen to this description from one agency. And this is an agency that's supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I quote here, The death of a child in infancy was far more common than it is today. In the healthiest 17th century communities, one infant in ten died before the age of five. In less healthy environments, three children in 10, died before their fifth birthday. The Puritan minister, Cotton Mather, very famous pastor in Boston, saw eight eight of his 15 children die before reaching the age of two. That early Puritan prayer with that reference to death was and is called a fixed prayer or a model prayer. It's easily memorized. And of course, the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer, is a fixed prayer. It's a model prayer. And the one that was read this morning in Scripture is a really pared-down version of the Lord's Prayer. And it begins with a declaration. God is holy. And then come five petitions. Five petitions, all corporate, all community, all kingdom. The first is to ask for the kingdom to come. Then, bread for us, forgiveness for us, our forgiving others, and finally, saving us from trial. And we should be shameless in asking for those things. Now, at the core of prayer is a simple truth. And maybe it's really the only thing I should say this morning. But here is the core. God is listening. God is listening. God is there. God wants to know. 
and wants you, wants me to give voice to what is on our hearts, what is aching, what we're carrying, what matters. It's not that God doesn't already know what's going on. But there is something about saying it. There's something about asking, getting it out there. It's a way to honor God and to honor ourselves especially when we pray for kingdom things like peace, wholeness, healing, forgiveness, community, justice, mercy, and right relationships. So go ahead, be shameless, and ask. God is listening. And that is good news. Amen. Part of our offering to God is to give voice to that which is of deep concern to us. Our sharing is an offering. There are so many ways in which we share. We share our gifts, skills, talents. We share our financial resources. And we share the totality of our lives. And so as we offer all of this to God, we're mindful of all that we've been given, all that's been bestowed upon us. And so we're grateful and give thanks. Amen.
Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Jim. Just mindful of those instruments. Um, it takes breath. I, I'm just thinking about how sacred that is to be able to create that beautiful music You're coming through your breath, being shaped by the instrument, of course. So thank you for that, especially on this day of prayer. So for our prayer this morning, I'm going to start us by asking you to maybe ponder two things and offer them to God. So it's, it's two parts, and we'll do this in silence. But the first part is asking for something that you feel would benefit the world. Okay, so the request is something about you, something that you desire, something that you might want, but it would have to be in service to the world, right? And then the second part is something that you generally would love to see happen in the world. So two things, something that you would want, that you would desire, that would help you serve God's world, and then something more generally, asking God that you'd like to see happen in the world. So we'll do this in silence. I'll ask you to find a place that's comfortable and centering, and let's, let's be in prayer. Oh, gracious God, we we give you thanks for the remarkable beauty of silence. To be in this place where love shelters us, this place when we present ourselves and know that you are present. Oh, holy, gracious God, there is so much that we want And we ask that the things that we desire be those things that help shape the realm and the atmosphere 
of an earth that is liberated from pain, from evil, from suffering, that we might somehow contribute to the easing of dis-ease. Oh, gracious God, there is so much dis-ease, so much anxiety, so much fretfulness, such deep divisions, such hatred, sometimes apathy. God, thank you for listening to us when we seek the higher way, the better way. God, we pray for our fragile world, the world we enjoy, the world in which we are free to frolic, to breathe deep and take in the sights of flowers and wildlife, the gleaming moonlight and the radiant sun. And yet, God, there is something about our entire society that puts our planet in peril. Glaciers are melting. People and wildlife are dying. Famine emerges. And so, God, we ask for forgiveness for the ways in which we've taken for granted your creation and your beauty here on earth. God, strengthen us in our prayer life. Invite us each and every day to center to lessen the anxiety so that we might be present and helpful to others. In their fears, in their worries, in their panic, in their pain. We pray all of this, remembering this very simple and fixed prayer, this model prayer. This prayer that Jesus taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning I'm reminded of how I am strengthened by my relationship with you, sisters and brothers in Christ. You know, I love working out. I work out every day at the gym, and I do strength training, and that's good. But my soul, to be strengthened, needs you. You need each other. We need God. And that's our strength training. That's where the core becomes sacred and strong for the welfare and the good of our planet. So God bless you and keep you. God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace now, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stick around following the postlude. We're going to get a little raucous with our friends on Zoom. You may be seated. Hey, Zoom friends, so good to see you this morning. Thanks for having your cameras on. It's always been a, it's always a blessing. God bless you. Have a good week. Bye. Bye, have a good week. Have a good week and stay cool. <laughs>